Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. It's really a delight to um, to be connecting with um, all of our Far Villages panelists. And also uh, we have a number of people that have been joining us on the regular um, from all around the world. Uh, and one thing Abayo and I have talked about a lot is, you know, when we do these anthologies, very often we try and say, okay, we've got a couple of people in Chicago and a couple of people in Nashville and let's put together a little event. But you know, um, in the time of COVID, we've been able to just, uh, you know, choose readers based on, you know, uh, the topics instead of geography and these these events have been have been so wonderful. So I'm so glad everybody's here. Um, I think we have a few more that will be coming in as we as we get started. Um, so official introduction. Um, I'm Diane Gettle. I'm the executive editor of Black Lawrence Press. And I'm just so delighted that you've joined us this evening for a discussion on reclaiming the artistic space uh, with contributors from Far Villages, welcome essays for new and beginner poets. And here, just throw it up right there so everybody can see, it's a beautiful cover. Um, and of course we have uh, the editor of the anthology, Abayomi Anamashin here with us tonight. Welcome Abayo. Um, this evening, evening's panelists will discuss the joys and challenges of carving out physical, mental, and emotional and temporal space in which to write. In Megan Merchant's essay, it will be lost in lint traps and found again in hummingbird eggs. How do we create this space? And once we create it, how do we make the most of it? David Meduli's meditation on ocean waves grapples with these questions and asks new ones. Duane Herman will discuss how the artistic space can double as a place of healing. And Claudia Savage offers practical advice for poets and writers with young children at home. Finally, John Gizlowski, I hope I'm getting that name pronounced well, <laughs> will we'll share his thoughts on writing in the face of tragedy and loss. Um, I'll begin by introducing tonight's poet essayists who will discuss their contributions to the anthology. And as the panelists are speaking, please feel free to drop questions or comments in the chat box at any time. And we'll use your notes in our open conversation once all of the contributors have completed their presentations. So we're gonna get started with Megan. And I thought I bookmarked your bio. And now I think maybe I didn't. So, oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, Megan Merchant lives in the tall pines of Prescott, Arizona with her husband and two children. She is the author of three full-length poetry collections with Glass Liar Press, Gravel Ghosts, The, Dark, the Dark's Humming, uh, Grief Flowers, and four chapbooks and a children's book, These Words I Shaped for You. She was awarded the 2016-2017 COG Literary Award, judged by Juan Felipe Herrera, the 2018 uh, Beulah Rose Poetry Prize, and most recently second place in the Pablo Neruda Prize for Poetry. She is an editor at the Comstock Review, and you can find her work at meganmerchant.wix.com slash poet. <laughs> Welcome, Megan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I love this topic so much and I thought I had a lot to say pre-COVID about reclaiming artistic space, but now that everybody is home full time and my children are not in school, um, I have a lot more to say about reclaiming artistic space. <laughs> I think that uh, everybody's probably in the same boat. So I'm happy to share uh, a little bit of my essay here. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing everyone else read and to opening up the discussion. So thank you for uh, curating this space and a bio, thank you for including my essay. This book is tremendous. And when I say that, I feel like it's a giant understatement. Um, I wanna shout it from the rooftops that every poet, whether they're beginning or aspiring or well-established in their career, can learn and feel and grow from this. So thank you for including my work. How to contain the whole fractured world. It is the blue hour. My children are nearing sleep and a dozy quiet has settled into the bones of this house. I'm writing this essay unprepared and a bit frightened that I might not succeed in scrapping it all together but I am no stranger to this tactic, the let's just see what happens magic of not having a recipe or enough time. If I waited until I knew what I was going to say, 
I might never sit down and tend to the page. There are too many other tasks to complete. I just finished taking a knife to the dryer's lint trap. My attempt at unclogging the potentially flammable fuzz that is clotted in that net. This could become an image in a poem or it could fall into the blurry tasks that fill my days as a stay at home mother of two. I have grown so familiar with this chaotic life that I'm actually afraid of the silence. I have taught my brain how to compose inside of the flurry of our daily agendas, loud joy, bleeping video games and crying children. Out of necessity, I've taught my brain how to carry a poem until it's ready enough to find the page and not worry about catching it at the moment of inspiration or committing to it before it is gone. It is after all, just a poem. It is not my son's daily seizure medication. It is not my children's safety or happiness. I've learned to release the assumed importance of creating, which in turn, has bloomed a great appreciation when the poem tumbles into being. I have learned to treat it like spirit, one that I absolutely trust will show up once I can find the time to tend to it properly, even if that takes seasons. This past spring, we had two hummingbird eggs appear in a low branch nest. I visited the mother every day until she grew comfortable with my presence. I could have extended my hand to feel her bright feathers, but chose not to. Instead, I spoke to her about my day, the weather, and motherhood. When her babies hatched, she allowed me to linger breaths away from the nest. She showed great trust. When I spoke with her, it was no different than speaking to the poems in wait or honoring the creative process. That process is not mystical in the sense that it is wholly shrouded in mystery, yet, I will be the first to admit that I do not fully understand how the poems come into being. I have learned over time, this is actually of little importance. I see it much like I see the difference between religion and spirituality. One is a container for the other. The poem is a container for the spirit. I was a container for my two children who share my genetic makeup, but are not my creations. They came from somewhere else. And if I spend too much time trying to logically puzzle it out, I would miss too many moments of laughter and joy. I would miss the beauty that is their lives. I would miss the lines, hymns, images, and sounds as they are unfolding. That's just a sneak peek. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Megan. I, I love what you had to say about containers. Um, that's that 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 really it resonated with me the first time I read your essay, and um, and 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 it 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 sh it sh uh, shined back again, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, any like tips and tricks to uh, to finding time to write in in the time of COVID? I mean, we can talk about this more at the end, but uh, but it seems to be the topic of your part of the topic of your essay. Mm -hmm. So um, the way that things have unfolded for us. So I have a, my youngest child has significant special needs, and uh, when we had the stay at home orders, we lost all of his therapies and all of his support, and so I became his not only his full time parent, um, therapist, teacher, entertainer, etc. Um, and I. I struggled really, really much at first because I didn't have time to sit down. And this is the, the first time going through something significant where I haven't been writing and I haven't even had the, the time or the space. And so um, I started drawing for the first time in my life instead. And then I started painting um, as a way to continue that art artistic expression and the way to hold those images and still tend to them. Um, and that's been, that's been what's been saving me, basically. I, uh, I stuck a drawing table right next to my son's desk. So when he's doing school, I'm sitting there just creating. Interesting. And so, so somehow painting allows you to be a little bit more present and, and focused. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, I can hold the space for the language to interact with him um, while at the same time use my body to create. So I don't really have to have that kind of um, 
I don't, my brain doesn't have to be a container for that language because it's present with what he needs. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm constantly handing him crayons or, you know, flipping pages or, you know, setting meetings on the screen for him. So I have to have that portion present. Well, I'm so sorry that you lost all of that support uh, because of COVID, but um, really, really happy to know that you found this, this new container um, for your artistic expression while still tending to him. Thank you so much for reading from your essay and, sh and sharing that personal story with us. I really, really appreciate it, Megan. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to Claudia Savage. Um, oh, and we have a last minute. Just letting someone join in. Okay, um, Claudia Savage is part of the performance duo Thick in the Throat Honey. Her latest collection of poetry is Bruising Continents with recent work in Bomb, Denver Quarterly, Columbia, Nimrod, Waterstone Review, and Anomaly. She is the 2018-2021 Black Earth Institute Fellow and her collaboration Reductions with a visual artist, Jacqueline Brickman is forthcoming in 2020. Um, her poetics are influenced by a rabid reading. I love that. Uh, Alice Coltrane and long hikes in drippy forests. She teaches privately and lives with her husband and daughter in Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Claudia. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you so much for choosing my, I had two essays. Thank you, Black Lawrence Press and also Abayo so much for choosing the two that um, are in there. Um, I decided to read, you know, I was kind of cracking up about this and similar to Megan, even just doing this reading today, I was like, does anyone have, are they, does anyone have artistic space right now? I don't know, we're trying. Um, <laughs> so I thought I'd, I'd read uh, the one about memorization, a little excerpt of that, because that is something that I'm continuing to do um, with my husband, the duo that I have with my husband. And so um, when we perform together, he's a woodwind player, we do that. So I will read from this. <clears throat> Reclaim artistic space through memorization. Writers are often a quiet introspective group. We mull, we ponder, we say things like, I can't come over, I need time to gather my energy. When you have children though, especially when they're young, constant need can take over quiet introspection. Nothing like two hours of water, water, blanket, blanket, mama, mama, for making your child's nap time become a mama necessity too. Getting your own artistic thoughts to arise in this din is ridiculously difficult. Even if you somehow magically still have a regular time you write, writing is not just about sitting down at the page. You need all the steps leading up to that moment, reading books, observing, thinking about your characters, engaging the backyard dogwood starting to bloom. So how do you preserve mental space for your work? For me, since the birth of my daughter, it has been about memorization. Memorization helps me hold onto my own language for more than just a minute. It has become the only way I can quiet the two-year-old's burgeoning vocabulary lodging in my head. It's easier than you think. Even in high school, I remember theater kids running around reciting their lines. I have found the easiest way to memorize is to pick a stanza and just repeat it to yourself. Maybe it's been years since you think you memorized anything but I guarantee that you do it all the time. I'm sure there is a favorite recipe you put together without looking at a cookbook because you've done it dozens of times. Or somehow you remember that new extra long password for your computer at work. Memorizing your work requires the same skills of repetition and practice. The added joy is that you are internalizing your work into your body. Take 10 minutes at the beginning of each weekday writing session and pick a piece you feel strongly about. This is no time for humility. Memorize work that you will like thinking about during the weeks to come. These lines as you lie in bed, sleep deprived and cranky will help you remember why you make art. So I thought I'd stop there. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Thank you so much, um, Claudia. And on a, on a personal level, I really, really resonated with this um, essay because it, 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 in the full version of this essay, you talk about your daughter who at the writing is two. And I also have a two-year-old little girl who's bopping around upstairs somewhere with her father. So I know all about what it's like to try and engage the artistic or often in my time, editorial space um, <laughs> with, with, with a little one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think I think it's been um, one of the things is that's been really powerful for me. I mean, my husband and I talk about this all the time. We met at an at an artist residency um, and fell in love, and and you know we were living a very bohemian lifestyle at first, uh, and then once we had kids, suddenly it was like, oh, someone has to make a living, and, and there has to be some level of routine, and uh, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, and I think. Um, what it taught me is that there's like no one method that's going to serve your whole life. Um, that to me is, is the biggest thing I tell my students. It's just, it's just kind of, you have to like allow yourself to continue to evolve with whatever's happening with your life. And of course now with COVID and all these sorts of things happening, um, I too, like Megan, I, it's been very difficult for me. I, I got a fellowship to finish a book and I've been having a terrible time um, because I've been working and childcare and everything's, he, you know, condensed. Um, but uh, what I find is that recently my husband and I did a gig and I was like, I'm just going to do this one poem, this one poem that I memorized, even though we weren't going to, we're going to just record that. And just to have that moment, um, in my body to kind of the way you recite when you memorize the way you say those lines it's super powerful to say them to your children so that they see you as this other being not just this person that caretakes them but like this you have some level of autonomy that i think is gorgeous my daughter thinks everyone's an artist too just we've totally corrupted her so she <laughs> Assumes everybody makes art. She's always asking, like it's. Well, she's really not hard. entirely wrong there. So, <laughs> exactly. So, so many people are 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 incognito artists. That's right. That's I, I love. I love. Uh, there is no one method that will serve a whole life. And a bio, drop that in the chat box. I, I love that. And it, it's it's also a way to approach craft, right? There's no yeah. one method that's going to help you through your writing life. If it's going to get pretty boring, in fact, even if, if it, you know you can wind up being a one trick pony if you just have this one thing you do again and again and again. Right. Right. So, well, thank you so much for that, Claudia. I really appreciate that. Um, next up, we have um, David. And please tell me, is it David David Maduli? Am I saying that right? Okay. Yeah. Great. Hi, David. David is again. Uh, we have so much discussion of family in these in these essays. You'll see this uh, showing up again and again. Uh, David is a father of two, veteran public school teacher, DJ, and the author of the chat book Three Thirty Three and a Third an alumnus of the Vona Voices, Las Dos Brujas, and Napa Valley Writers Workshop. He was the recipient of the Joy Harjo Poetry Prize in 2011. Born in San Francisco and raised all over, he's a longtime resident of Oakland, California. He completed his MFA in creative writing at Mills College with a fellowship in community poetics. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. Thank you, Black Lawrence Press and Ohio, and, you know, for editing and presenting this beautiful and crucial book. Um, I'm honored and excited to be here with you all. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll read um, the first maybe a couple sections of, of the piece, which um, is kind of put together. It's kind of a mishmash or um, uh, sequenced from different pieces. So there is poetry uh, essay and kind of reflection all kind of mixed up in into it. All right, so it's called Shore Breaks. And um, yeah, Ocean of Home. I could always hold my breath underwater a long, long time, even as a little girl. Back then, I could read the same book over and over for hours. I could also go for days without eating. In the vast ocean, there are endless, continuous waves. At times, they build in frequency or amplitude, but they are always coming. The vast ocean is also many oceans, and there are many shores the waves reach. 
there are waves approaching the Farallon Islands. And at the same time, there are waves barreling toward the Southern Philippines, the Cape of Good Hope, the Caribbean, and so on, and therefore, and such and such. Imagine the ocean is the great pool of consciousness of the universe. The waves are the forces that carry those thoughts, ideas, memories, bodies, spirits, colors, sounds, words, breaths. They are always present and they are always whirling, reacting, colliding, mixing, submerging, and surfacing. Having barely made it through the first semester and just starting a new one in an MFA program with a one-year-old and three-year-old in tow, tough news came in the form of a thin white piece of plastic. My wife was pregnant again. Not knowing how to respond, I dropped the takeout lunch on the table, mouthed, oh, and then headed out for my writing time that had been previously agreed upon and Google calendared. I didn't write. I parked at the library and leaned back in the car seat, drifting in and out of sleep. A few days later, when she asked me what we should do, and eventually said, we can't keep it. I responded, if that's what's best for you, knowing damn well, only she had the guts to decide for both of us, for all of us. Green, gold, vein, shoulder blade, gold, not hangnail, gold, broke ankle, gold, lost larynx, gold. The artist, or any human being for that matter can go where the waves are. There are many maps and markers and documents from those before that point the way. There are also living masters who can take us to secret or secluded reef breaks and shore breaks, places that have been passed down through the ages. We might also find a special place unintentionally while out for a nice stroll or row through an area we've never been. There are things we need to do to prepare ourselves for the journey and for when we get there. Muscles we need to build, tools we need to learn how to use, some tools may be gifted to us. Some we might have to earn, others might require that we fashion them ourselves. We will have to prepare our bodies and minds, learn how to hike, swim, breathe, learn how to navigate paths, read the weather and the currents, learn how to speak to the people and the flora and fauna. At some point, we will reach the water, set off into the water, and encounter the waves. At the moment of encounter, we will need all of our training and muscle memory and knowledge of tradition to both recognize the movement of the wave and to catch the wave. Then what we need is courage and confidence to stand up and ride it. To ride that wave for that instant or moment in time, and some definitely last longer than others, is to be immersed in the consciousness of the universe the artist's hand, tongue, body, mind, and soul are moving in unison with the universe. What the artist creates is both reflection of the ancient and projection of the futuristic. It actually doesn't matter. Both old and new are the same. What the artist creates is evidence of that ride on that wave at that moment in time. Over a year later, I finished my thesis and my program. My wife was finally up for a full-time position after years of the adjunct grind and my two children growing fast. For two years, I've written diligently about my 99-year-old grandma's house in the outer mission of San Francisco, a home that has held four generations of family and immigrants from the Philippines. I've written about my experiences as a 14-year veteran in public school, middle and high school teaching. I've written about life through the lens of music, through the ears and fingers of a DJ, but it was in this last semester that I began to understand and attempt to investigate the confluence between fatherhood and writing. I created a private blog and enacted a daily practice of audio recording my children's voices, snapping photos and jotting down things they say. At two and four, they were discovering language, testing it out, playing with it, experiencing the joys and frustrations of expression. Every night I would review the media on my phone and write a response, prose, a poem, a fragment, whatever came. I would tell my classmates I learned to steal my kids' best lines. More importantly, I learned to be more present in my time with them and do my best to give them their dad at his best.
I'll pause, pause there. Thank you so much, David. That was wonderful. And it resonates a lot for those of you who were with us last week. We were talking a lot about, it was, we were talking about um, the, the poet's journey, but there was a, a lot of discussion about um, uh, when you're a writer, if you're, if you're constantly sort of a, a, a little bit removed from the present moment because you're trying to find out how do I turn this moment into the poem. And, um, and I feel like we could have used your wisdom in that conversation last week talking about how to be present um, with your kids and really give them their best dad, but also be sort of uh, mining that experience for your craft. I think that's really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, John Gazlowski, and I think I, I think I said that right. Um, John's writing appears on Garrison Keillor's Writer's Almanac and in Rattle, Ontario Review, North American Review, and many other journals here and abroad. His poems and personal essays about his Polish parents' experiences as slave laborers in Nazi Germany and refugees making a life for themselves in Chicago appear in his memoir, Echoes of Tattered Tongues, which received the 2017 Benjamin Franklin Poetry Award and the Eric Hoffer Foundation's Montaigne Award. Congratulations. Congrats. He is also the author of the Hank and Marvin Noir <clears throat> series. Welcome, John, and thank you for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I've been, I've been, I should be lifting up the book. Hold on. Uh, I've enjoyed this book a lot. Uh, I like reading about, uh, I like reading about writers, and uh, this is the best book I've read by writers talking about writers writing in a long, long, long time, and uh, I've really enjoyed the book and. Thank you for putting me in the book. Uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk about language and loss, and uh, I'm gonna read uh, uh, from uh, the piece that I've got in the uh, the book. Uh, language and loss. My friend, the writer Christina San Antonio, and I have been having a conversation about writing about loss. It's a conversation fueled in part by the suicide of the novelist David Foster Wallace back in 2008. She wrote me a long letter about how we use or don't use language to talk about loss and about how hard it is to write about loss. One of the things in her letter that really resonated with me was something she said about one of my favorite writers, Primo Levi, the Holocaust survivor and author of Survival in Auschwitz, who like Wallace apparently took his own life. Primo Levi frequently talked about the frustration of trying to write about loss and suffering, especially the loss and suffering he and so many others, so many others experienced in the Nazi camps. He felt we needed a new kind of language to talk about what happened there. Christina wrote that we ache for a language that doesn't exist. I've spent the last 40 years trying to find words to describe what happened to my Polish Catholic parents in the German concentration and slave labor camps and what those experiences make me feel. I write about this event or that image and no matter how powerful the original event described by my mother or my father, I can't really describe it, explain it, bring it out of the past. I can't bring it out of memory into this life. Instead, I'm left pushing around some words, trying to make myself feel what I felt the first time I heard a story when I was a child. Sometimes I think I almost succeed, but most of the time I know I'm not even close. For me, the poems that work best are the ones with my parents' actual words in them. Those words are the real thing. In my poem, here's what my mother won't talk about. My mother refuses to tell me anything about the murder of her mother and her sister and her sister's baby and my mother's own rape. All she will say to me is, if they give you bread, you eat it. If they beat you, you run away. Likewise, in my poem, the work my father did in Germany, my dad tells me what he said to the German guards who tormented and beat him and blinded him. He said, 
please, sirs, don't ever tell your children what you've done to me today. There are bits and pieces of their words scattered throughout my poems. And when I read those words out loud, my parents are there with me. I'm again a child listening to my father tell me about the day he saw a German soldier cut off a woman's breasts or listening to my mother tell me about the perfect house she lived in in the perfect woods in Eastern Poland before the Germans came. My parents' words are a kind of magic to me, but how do I convey this magic to other people? I think sometimes that all I can do is read my poems out loud and show people how those poems affect me. I guess what happens then is that my words become like my parents' words. I become my mother and my father for that moment in the poem. Sometimes I think this touches people, conveys the magic to them that I feel. I've seen this happen at some of my poetry readings. A person stands up at the end of the reading when I invite questions and he doesn't say anything. He just stands there. I don't know if the person even has a question. Maybe he just wants to show me how much he feels my parents' lives. Or maybe the loss I talk about somehow reminds him of a loss he experienced and couldn't talk about and still can't talk about. For me, one of the central images of the Bible is the image of the Tower of Babel. It represents in my eyes the moment when humanity became trapped in language that would not communicate what we need to communicate. It was a second fall from grace. Our lives became chained to a language that doesn't convey what we feel or what we mean. Although we have this deep need to say what we feel, we often can't explain it to ourselves or to other people. Sometimes our words fail us and sometimes other people fail us. They can't bring themselves to listen to our stories of loss. It's hard to take on that burden. When my father was dying, he told me a story about a Lithuanian friend of his in Buchenwald concentration camp. Uh, excuse me, uh, a story about a Lithuanian friend of his in a Buchenwald concentration camp who had made love to a German woman and contracted VD. This friend came to my father and asked him what, my, what he should do. My father said, go to the river and drown yourself. His friend thought my father was joking and he went to another friend who told him, tell the Germans what you did. My friend's father did that and the soldiers killed the woman and then they beat my father's friend, castrated him and killed him. 50 years after his friend's death, when my father was telling me this story, he still didn't know what he could have said to his friend to save him from what happened. No matter how hard it is to tell someone something, no matter how hard it is to get beyond the babble, we're caught up in it. Will it, excuse me, we're caught up in it. Oh, excuse me, I'm gonna read that last paragraph. No matter how hard it is to sell some, to tell someone something, no matter how hard it is to get beyond the babble we're caught in, I think we need to try. Will it change the world? Make anything different? Make it better, we can only hope. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, John. What a powerful essay. Um, and speaking of, of words falling short, powerful does, doesn't quite do it. Um, I love the idea of, of needing a new language to talk about something that, mm -hmm. that's, that's so so chilling and, and, and so, um, you know, get, gets right to the sort of cracks at the core of humanity um, and, and aching for a language that doesn't exist. Um, that it's just, you know, th those are those are thoughts. I don't I don't have anything to reflect back other than to say I'm going to meditate on those ideas for a long time. Thank you so much. Uh, let me say one thing. It, it was interesting to me as a growing up with my parents that my father was somehow able to find ways of talking about uh, his experiences. And my mother, for most of her life, 
couldn't talk about, couldn't talk about those experiences. Uh, there was always a silence when she tried to find the words to uh, talk about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I'm sure well, we'll have, I, I, I see that we already do have some comments coming through uh, for you for uh, our, our conversation towards the end. Um, but before we, we just open up uh, to uh, questions for all of our panelists. We have one more panelist. Uh, Dwayne Herman is a fifth generation Kansan farming on a tractor by age 13. His collection to the land is reflected in his writing. Internationally published, award-winning poet and historian, his work is published in a dozen countries in four languages. He's received the Robert Hayden Poetry Fellowship, the Ferguson, Kansas History Book Award, inclusion in Kansas's, poet, in Kansas's Poets Trail Map, sorry about that, um, and American Poets of the 1990s. He's authored seven collections of poetry, a collection of short stories, and a science fiction novel, despite a traumatic childhood with dyslexia, ADHD, and PTSD. Welcome, uh, welcome, Duane, and I'm looking forward to hearing you read from your essay. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and I have more thanks to say, but I can't find words for them, so I'll just skip that part. I was reading my piece before, just before this evening to see what to share, and there's two parts I want to share. One is the important part, and one is the exciting part, and as I was reading it, I and, and, I, and as I wrote it, I remembered this is really, this experience that I'm gonna share still is the most ex exciting experience in my life. And it happened when I was five years old, which was more than 60 years ago, but it still is. And uh, so that's why I sh share that part. One day I was in a place far from home and I was told that two writers were also there, real honest to goodness writers. Did they look anything at all like the normal people I knew? I had to find out, but no one can told, could know. I was told to stay away from them, so I could not be obvious. I found out where they would be located. I figured out a way to get there unobtrusively. I determined the best time for sighting them, then set my plan in motion. I crept silently, carefully, and slowly. I could not give myself away. I didn't want to be disobedient. As I crept closer to them, I began to hear a sound that I'd never heard before. It sounded much like rain. The sky was sunny and there was no cloud, so I knew it could not be rain. Whatever it was, was music to my ears. It was an enchanting sound. The closer I became, the louder and more distinct the sound. There were pauses in the sound, but not many. It was continual, rising and falling, dancing. Finally, I was close enough. I knew they would be directly in sight when I simply looked around the corner. I still had to be careful not to be seen. I could not bother them. I quickly peeked. There sat two young men, veritable gods, typing on their typewriters. I was spellbound. They looked just like normal people, but so different. Before I could get caught, I withdrew and hurried away so I could not be found near them. Still, I was in heaven. I had seen two actual writers actually writing. I floated away. They looked as normal as anyone else, but they were writers. If such normal looking people as they were could be writers, then there was no reason why a normal looking person such as myself could not also be a writer. And, uh, and I have, have become that. Then the, um, the important part. Um, most importantly, writing poems and other things has helped me to heal. Poetry is empowering. In writing about experiences one could not control, one gains control. Writing is empowering. I control what I write. When I write about my childhood, I gain control over it. Poetry is power. And I didn't actually understand, didn't have that clearly until I read about it, and I, I was doing it, but I didn't understand what I was doing. But when you write about something traumatic, you control what you write about. And so therefore you can gain a level of control over that experience. And, and my, my childhood was, yes, abusive and a few other things. And I started running away from home when I was two and a half. I was suicidal before then, but I started making stories 
about that time also because I'd had a dream and I liked, I wanted the dream to continue. And so I continued it in my head and I couldn't write anything down because I had to do work taking care of my little brothers and sisters and things. But I always made a story in my head uh, at night when I was going to sleep, when I was riding on the school bus. So I was always creating in my head. And gradually after I left home and got through college and I had a little bit of time and I would begin to write things down. And then when I retired, I could really write things down a lot more. But it was having those stories in my head and I still, that's where they come. I mean, they, they come while I'm working. Uh, and so that's, that's the space that it starts in my head. And then when I can write them down, I do. And I carry paper with me and I, I write probably wherever I am and whatever paper there is if I don't have paper with me. So that's a little bit of that. Thank you, Duane. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate, um, you know, everyone being so open with personal stories. Um, and I, I suppose that's necessary to talk about reclaiming artistic space. Um, how can you do that without, without getting into the personal? Um, so now we're going to open uh, the discussion up for questions or comments. Um, and I'll begin, so please feel free to add th some things to the chat box, but I'll begin by going through, oh, I think somebody else, somebody unmute, do you wanna have, have something to say? John, is that you? Oh no, I just, I was just unmuting my, uh, my microphone, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, well, we have a lot of comments for you, John. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Dulika Raj, who's joining us from Bangkok said, um, I'm working through poems and material from uh, the partition and your talk resonates so much with the memory loss and connection with the legacies of the atrocities that are buried in our families. Thank you, thank you for sharing these stories. We are all caught in that tower. Wow, Zulika, thank you so much for, for adding that comment and sharing that with us. Um, Claudia Savage writes, thank you so much, John. So many of our families can't talk about generational atrocity, but we see now in this moment how important it is to not forget. Um, and Carol Yoho writes, John, your writing touched me deeply. It's hard to be brave and tell hard truths, extreme adversity. So, um, so clearly your, 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 uh, your reading really touched a lot of people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I, you know, I, I, I like writing about my parents. Uh, I couldn't write about them for a long, long time because I wanted to, uh, I wanted to get away from the sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, problems they were having uh, as refugees in America, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I did write about my parents. And uh, when, I, when I talk to people about writing, uh, I, I encourage people to always write about their, uh, their parents and their own lives. Uh, I think it's important to, uh, to, to uh, preserve those memories. Yeah. Um, it makes me think, if, if, I, if I may uh, <laughs> discuss uh, another book from the Black Lawrence Press list, and I, I do actually have a copy right here. Um, we actually have a, a, a new poetry collection. Um, this is How the Bone Sings by Todd Kaneko. And it's the entire collection is about um, his family's uh, experiences in Japanese internment camps. Huh. Um, and it's, it's, in, it's incredibly powerful stuff. And of course, he didn't experience any of it, um, but it's, it's the stories that have been passed down and how he's seen it affect um, Especially, he, he he sort of follows the uh, the line of um of uh, the the paternal line in his family and how how it's affected the the men along that line. So, um, yeah, really powerful, really powerful stuff. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up, and this can kind of go out to all of the panelists, and we started to touch on this in the beginning, but you know, in in the current pandemic, we're sort of in the situation where we're either completely thrust together with family, and there's very little physical, emotional, mental, temporal space or very distant, right? And I think that a lot of people are, are, are sort of managing, uh, you know, missing people that they would like to be able to see. I know a lot of people are currently having the hard conversation that, you know, the, the winter hall or the fall and winter holidays simply won't take place the way they were supposed to. And then also struggling with, um, you know, people that you could maybe use a break for, break from. <laughs> so how, how are you sort of dealing with, um, finding space now. I mean, I know we were writing, we were, you were writing these essays before COVID. Um, and, and Megan, I know you touched on that a little bit with painting. Does anyone else have 
uh, comments or suggestions or just experiences they want to share? Well, I'm one of the people where everything is distant because my children live in different cities. One lives 500 miles away. And for her and I, the hardest part is we can't hug anybody. So I have lots of time, but it's that need for that, that physical contact that's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah, and there's no replacement for that, right? There's no Zoom call that, that, that solves that need. When my son was working in Israel and I was complaining about that, he said, hug the phone, dad. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Anyone else have, have uh, experiences they want to share about finding an artistic space specifically during COVID times? I think you have to, I just want to share. So you mentioned that I work with, I work with a, or I have worked with a visual artist. We don't know when because of COVID, uh, what we were supposed to be doing this year with our, the show is, is not happening. Um, but uh, she's somebody who has three children and um, she has mentioned to me before that she goes into her tunnel and she did this before COVID where there's utter chaos in her house. I mean, just total disaster. And then she'll just make art like in her, she's like, I'm in my tunnel in my head. And I think, I think um, that that's a, I mean, I grew up with, my mom was a painter. And so I grew up with people that, you know, could like paint in tiny little spaces when there was chaos around. But I think, uh, from my perspective, it's 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 lowering that expectation, like, <laughs> and then lowering it more. <laughs> like if you normally produce, you know, you have three hours to work on something, or you normally produce, you know, now it's kind of like I'm putting down a line, or, yeah. you know, that's where I'm at. <laughs> you know, like I did I did something, um, I made something. So I'm curious what other people. Uh I feel that one of the things that the uh, pandemic is doing is slowing down my writing. Uh, I, I, I've been writing novels for the last uh, 10 years. And normally, normally I'll write, you know, in the space of three or four hours, I'll write about a thousand words. And now in the space of three or four hours, I write about 50 words. And um, I'm not sure why that is, but there's, there's something about like, maybe the lack of, of contact people or the lack of uh, the possibility of um, Stepping outside and doing things. Uh, it's really slowing me down. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, cramping my, uh, my creative uh, energies. I guess, kind of John, I, I, think, I think we're having a little. John, I think we're having a little bit of a hard time with your connection. Is anyone else experiencing that, or is it just on my end? Yeah, um, I, I, I think that I think that we heard a lot of that about it, you know, slowing down. And your your uh, your image is frozen as well. I'm so sorry about that. But we I think we all heard that you know COVID has kind of slowed down the process. It, you know, the, there's less generation. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry we didn't maybe get all of what you were going to say, but it seems like maybe you're totally frozen now. <laughs> Oh, now, now, now we're getting some really great, like electronic experimental music. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. Um, you might want to try exiting the meeting and coming back in. Sometimes that helps. Um, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the, on the waiting room. So sorry about that. Um, Um, we have a question from our editor, um, a bio uh, for Megan Merchant. Knowing that the poem will be there when you have the space takes a great deal of trust. How long did it take you to trust that your poem will be there when you finally have time to write and do you struggle with it? <laughs> Thanks, Abaya. 
Um, I struggled so much with this. I actually went and started when my when my kids were little, um, and I was. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. I I think something from our previous uh, chat with John kind of overlapped for a okay. second. Cool. I don't hear it anymore. I think, um, I think it's done. Cool. Um, yeah, when my uh, my children were very little and I was staying home with them, um, I worried a great deal. And it was kind of a giant stressor. Like, how am I going to find this time and space? And so I actually started to research um, uh, neural pathways and neuroplasticity to figure out how my brain had changed after birth and then how things were working now. Um, and I also learned a lot about, um, there was this beautiful speech that, and I'm trying to remember who I heard it from. I think it was Pema Chodron who talked about the storehouse of consciousness, this idea in Buddhism that as we're moving through the world, we have this basement like structure in ourself that we're collecting all of these sounds and images and um, things that our brain is picking up that we're not conscious of. And so I kind of started to focus on that and switch into that mode of, all right, what's gonna happen if I sit down and I get two words on the page and then I need to get a juice box and I need to get <laughs> goldfish crackers and then I need to clean up this mess um, and just kind of allowing that, that permission and allowing that time and that space and those things to enter the poem. Whereas before I was a fierce defender of like, I'm gonna sit in my office for four hours and stare at the blank screen as this luxurious process and call myself a writer. <laughs> It's going to be wonderful. And now I was sitting in this tiny little desk in the corner of the kitchen when my kids were like ramming trains into my feet and demanding everything all of the time. And just allowing this permission and allowing my brain to kind of settle into that, that groove and that pattern and allow everything to come into the poem and to that space. And if it got off track, then it was just into a new avenue or a new space um, that I would try to tend to as best as I could. And so it took so much trust in my brain, to be honest. Um, and that developed out of necessity. It, it kind of wasn't a slow rolling process. It was a survival. I need to write. And so I need to find a new way to be able to, to do this and to tend to this process. Um, and I kind of tried to see it as growth more than as being stifled. Does that make sense? So thank you for asking that question. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. Maybe they can also jump in. Yeah, does anybody else wanna jump in on that? Well, when I did my first book, oh, sorry. When I did my first book, I was, I had just finished building the house. And so that was my full-time job was building the house. And I I had an, the, a, a room for my office and my son was, of several months old, I don't know now how, maybe six months old or so. And I put the play pin in the middle of my office and I was sitting there with my back to it and with my computer, which was my first computer. And he could play for maybe eight to 10 minutes by himself. And then he would squawk because he wanted attention. And so I would turn around and talk to him and interact and that would satisfy him for another eight or 10 minutes. And I got the book done, but what was in, in little short spurts like that until he flipped himself out of the playpen twice. And then I knew that that was the end of that. So I made a little playroom in the hall right outside the door, which was bigger than the playpen and it could have bigger toys and he was able to play longer. And so that was a much, much more help. But what I didn't realize was while he was, while I was working, he was watching me and I would later then, I would come into my office when he was, oh, maybe a year, he could go up and down the stairs and I would find my computer on and I knew that I had turned it off. And so one day when we were both upstairs, I saw him go down and so I quietly followed him and he went down and in my office and he got up on the chair and he mimicked all of the steps that I needed to do then to turn on the computer. But at that time you had to load the program and he couldn't do that part. So all he could do was turn it all on. And so computers were normal for him. And now 
he is my resident IT assistant. And I've been on the phone with him today, even already about three different things. So he totally understands how my brain does not work as well as a lot of other people's, but he knows the ways it doesn't work and the kinds of things that will, will, will stumble me. And he knows, well, dad, you don't do it that way. <laughs> do this instead. <laughs> and this is your workaround. <laughs> and so it's a very, very nice thing. But if I hadn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be that if I hadn't have been patient and given him space while I had space and we were sort of, you know, buds actually. And it's been this very, very nice for me since he's grown up that, that we're, we're doing that. Thank you. Yeah, um, that kind of dovetails into another question that I had, which was actually the physical space that people create for themselves. I mean, you know, of course, depending on where you live, you might be in a place where it's quite easy to get, um, you know, a spacious home without the rent or the mortgage being too high, or you might be in a city where every square inch is <laughs> um is is really precious um and so if people would be open for talking a little bit about um how they uh choose and uh, there are their their actual space where they work and what they put in it and the objects that are important to them i always find that so fascinating Anyone want to jump in? I, I think we're in some of those spaces right now, which is one of the fascinating things about these Zoom calls. Claudia, I know. You oh, I'm sorry. I, I know. I saw that you had one of your uh, ch child's toys that was right there with you. Yeah, I uh, actually, on purpose, I'm in my living room where. Yeah, there's like a weird pillow behind me because I, I normally, I, I realize now writers are starting, we're all getting into that space where we like do the Zoom call with all the books behind us. Like, look, I'm for real, here I am. Um, <laughs> I did an epic one a couple days ago where there was somebody I'd never seen. I mean, it was it was amazing. It was like, you know, floor to ceiling. No, I, I think for me, I, um, I'm sitting here because that that space in the back is is become my work office uh, for my job, and I just I haven't figured it out. I keep I think I keep switching around. Um, part of it is that I'm at the point now. It all depends on whether you're generating or finishing, right? So I'm at the point now where I'm trying to finish my book, and it's normally a process where I will spread all the poems everywhere, like on the floor, all over. Um, but I, I can't really do that because my kids here, my husband's here. I mean, we're all just all over each other. So, um, and also I, I don't have that sort of time where I can go and then, try. so I think for me right now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm sort of moving things off one computer onto another computer and trying to decide. Um, I create often outside. So I, I will often take my computer with me and go somewhere away to a park somewhere away. Um, I'm curious what other people do, like if they have that bifurcation between creation and then assembly, that's my hardest thing. Does anyone wanna jump in on that? I About, will. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, so for years and years, I had a tiny little desk in the corner, shoved into the corner of the kitchen and like, it was such a disaster. There would be sticky fingerprints all over my papers and the books would be everywhere. And, I loved it. it. It just worked because I was in rhythm and in sync and present with my children. And at the same time, trying to tend to this need to write. Um, the room I'm in now, this was a gift from my husband um, for my 40th birthday. Um, he decided I needed a room of my own, but it hasn't worked out that this is where I create because this is where everybody else comes to do their schoolwork and <laughs> their therapy, online therapy sessions and everything. Um, so I'm constantly scribbling notes in my iPhone, um, as I'm kind of moving about the day, whenever my kids have this, like, you know, a moment where they're focused on what they need, I'm tending to whatever's in front of me, a piece of paper, um, a journal, I have drawing notebooks everywhere. Um, my iPhone is, is huge. I, I will even call my husband and leave voicemails cause I know he won't pick up. Um, if I need to remember something. 
So instead of texting it to myself, because it will actually bother me to see it and not be able to tend to it, I will call and leave it on his voicemail. And then after the kids go to sleep, I will ask him like, okay, what did it say? (laughs) (laughs) And he's so used to it now that it's just totally normal for us. Um, And we work in that rhythm, which is good. But um, yeah, I do. I love this office space and it was a beautiful gift uh, to have a room of my own, but it is not my own. So (laughs) I am, I am the house. (laughs) My creative process is the house. (laughs) I live alone and I own the house and it's the first time that I've been in charge of a place where I lived. And I, I didn't, I'm very good at saving and collecting. I, I cannot sort and put away. So there are stacks of books and papers. And my oldest son once looked at it and said, for you, this is organized, isn't it? And I, yeah, this is the best I can do. I can sometimes, that you notice the light, there's a big light on one side. That's because this is my writing chair before COVID, before the laptop, before all this stuff. And then for this meeting, I put another lamp on that side so you can see this half my face. Otherwise people just see this half, which means I only have to shave half my face, but that's, that's a different matter. Most of my creating I do outside in the country because I have some farmland from where I grew up. And I will just write on scraps of paper, but lots of times it gets dark before I can get it all written down. So then I just scribble or try to keep it in my head. But it's, it's much harder to put a book together than it is to write the individual poems for the book. The individual poems, they, they can sometimes just, just come out. And, and sometimes I'll get a memory, like just, just a couple of weeks ago, I got a memory of the first time I had to work with the stove. And I had, was ordered to stir something in the pan and it was above my head. The flames were still above my head and to reach over around the flames was terrifying. But I was able to write it and get it down and and in my writing group, which met just last night, I shared it and one person, we've been meeting for 30 years or so. And she said, this is the best thing you have written in all this time because I had everything right there. But it just almost spilled out. I mean, I didn't change hardly any words of it. So. I guess there's a lot of cooking time, I I guess. That kind of uh, goes back to what Megan was saying about having this sort of basement that just collects and collects and collects. And then then, then sometimes everything's just there and ready for you. Um, We have a question um, from Claudia to David. uh, And she says, David, I'm wondering how you work it with two kids and two full-time jobs. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what everyone has been saying has been resonating with me about um, just embracing the mess, the messiness, um, you know, not, not necessarily trying to carve out specific time and space, but letting, letting the time and space that you're in kind of provide for an opportunity here or there to write something down. Um, you know, with the kids right now, um, and, you know, definitely my wife and I are balancing, um, you know, working and them being at home with distance learning and um it's it's definitely like we're still not really into a rhythm with the school year for how like i I, i'm still pretty baffled like i'm a career educator i'm still pretty baffled with what what my students my my kids um like second grade homework is supposed to be or like what time they're supposed to be in their class um but what I do know is that at some point we have to get outside because it's, um, you know, it's just too much. And um, there's just too much. Uh, it's hard for me, especially to see them on the screens so much. And so, you know, fortunately for us being in the Bay Area, um, you know, also tragically there being the fires and everything lately and just a lot of the, 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 the tough things happening. But um, when we can, you know, the, the redwoods are five minutes away, the beach is 10 minutes away. So um, either, either or, or just even just walking around the neighborhood. My daughter, she is one of the best, some of the best times for writing is when she, we go to the redwoods, she brings her notebook to, and she'll kind of facilitate the writing, you know, and be like, okay, we're gonna stop here at this log. She'll set the timer 
um, you know, she'll kind of give me prompts, you know, hey, daddy, you could write about that tree over there. Um, and just to kind of do the do it alongside my children is the best and kind of a, a carryover from what I what the the muscles I had started to build when I wrote the piece, you know, a few years back is, um, yeah, just just kind of going with the flow and um, not not resisting the moments when it's it's hard or the days that go by without writing just knowing that again like um you know i've been saying like trusting that 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 time the times will come and david are you still uh working as a public school teacher so are you are you doing all of that remotely as well in addition to helping your kids with their home learning yeah i mean right now i'm in a role kind of supporting and, and training and coaching teachers so it's it's not as intense as i would say uh as as um teachers who are holding the the day-to-day -day planning and and hold you know holding space for students um but still very much in in the mix of the like the planning the district like what is distance learning what are what are our goals and it's um very it's it's yeah it's it's challenging it's tough <laughs> thank you thank you for for sharing that with us um any other questions that people want to to drop in about artistic space creating it holding it changing it how we have it at all with covid i have a i have a follow-up question so i've been thinking about the title of this section and I love the essays in this section. And I've been thinking about it all while our panelists have been talking. And I've been thinking about those people who feel as if the conversation has left them. They are no longer part of the community. So somebody has a child, um, children give us so much wonderful, so much wonderful experiences. It's a privilege to raise a child. But also the reality as people have been saying is that our artistic spaces begin to shrink quite a bit because the kids require a lot of time. You're raising a whole human being for the very first time. They look to you for the bl blueprint of the world. So, and many people tend to just say, you know what, it's too much. I'm gonna put this on hold for some time and try to come back to it. And the reality is that some of those people begin to feel as if there's just no way they can be part of the conversation anymore. It's left them, the boat has sailed and so on and so forth. What kinds of advice can we give those people who feel as if, um, when it comes to artistic creations, when it comes to writing poetry, um, the ship has sailed. They're no longer part of the current conversation, no longer part of the community because they have, because they have responsibilities. Can I answer that one? Because I love that one. That's like the best ever. Because my husband and I, when, when we first had our daughter, we did a podcast for a while um, under Thick and the Thread Honey. Like we just interviewed all of our friends who had children who we knew did not, we joked, did not have a sugar mama or sugar daddy. In other words, we didn't interview any of the artists that we knew like, oh, your wife's a pediatrician, whatever, like you have time. Um, and I think, I think, um, I think there's, there's two different things there where one is, what is it you want to, are you, are you an artist? Are you achieving for yourself or are you trying to be, and, and what does that mean to you to, with your community? I mean, those, you know what I mean? So there's two different things. Like one is there's the ambition piece of being an artist. And then there's the piece of self-fulfillment and being, uh, you know, giving your heart to the community. And so I think for me, I had to find that place where I'm constantly checking in to say, why am I creating? Why am I making something? And is this allowing me to live? And in which case, does it matter if I submit this work? Does it matter how many books I have out in the world? Like, how am I cultivating? And I think doing the podcast was 
it was really powerful because we talked to artists in all different disciplines who had children. And the number one thing was they were all like, if I stop doing this, I will not exist as the person I want to be in the world. So it, yes, I am not able anymore to go out and drink whiskey until three in the morning with my writing friends. I cannot do that. And I may never do that, but I don't know that that is the goal. Um, just to say, I think maybe the goal is how I give myself to others with my artistic practice when I can. So, yeah. I'll piggyback on that. Um, one of the things that uh, we say around here is fuel the jet. Um, and that literally means like, what helps me to feel most like myself, to feel energized, to feel like I can take on all of the daily necessities and tasks. And that is creating some form of art, whether it's writing, painting, drawing, um, it doesn't matter. Like I could take a piece of paper and fold it up and have this whole imaginary conversation in my head, but that's fueling the jet. And one of the things that I really struggled with was if I take away from my children, from the time with them, from my family space, then the system will collapse. And it took a long time for me to recognize that that's false and that I actually am the system. And that if I'm not in a place where I feel the most human and the most alive and some little bit of joy, then the system will collapse. And so um, I love what Claudia said about like, what's the intention there? Is it to, you know, what's, is it to be ambitious and to have your work out in the world? That might not always happen and that space might not be available. But if you're doing it for yourself to, to fuel the jet, then it's really vital that you do that. That would be my advice. I write to keep myself alive because there are times when in my life I have truly been unable to write because of responsibilities or just energy exhaustion and I, I barely survive them. I mean, I did not feel like I was a, a real person but when I'm writing, I feel real. And I, I, I don't quite understand that, but I don't fight it anymore. And blessedly, I'm retired now. So I, I choose what I can do and when I do it mostly. And it's, it's just wonderful because it's the first time in my life since I was two and a half that I haven't had to work for somebody else and please somebody else. And so it's just really, really nice. And I feel much more real than I ever have. So it's, it's for my own. And, 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 and when somebody accepts something, that's like total frosting that my brain is worthwhile to someone else. I have felt it was worthwhile to me, but to have someone else validate it saying, I want to share yours, your stuff with the world through my channels. It's like, oh my God, really? And um, so that's, that's, that's just wonderful. Um, and, 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 and just today, I, this just amazes me. Um, I got an email from a publisher in Germany who wants to see some of my stuff. And I'd even, I, I met him last summer sometime over there and totally forgot about him. And, and then it just came and I'm thinking, really? <laughs> It's just like, wow, okay, we'll see what can happen here. But it's, it's an amazing thing. I think it's such an interesting question, Abaya, and I, I love that question. Um, Claudia said that as well. Um, you know, one thing that um, strikes me is people start something and they start a career. And, and I've seen this now that I've been working on this press for about 15 years, um, you know, people go through times where they're publishing a lot and maybe they have, you know, two books out in three years and, and then all of a sudden you stop hearing from them and you don't see them in the journals where you used to see them. And, 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 you know, you, you they used to get emails and used to see them on social media with new poems. And, and, and then I've had people email me saying, Hey, I've been going through a rough time, sometimes just with writing, but sometimes with other things as well that impacts the writing and feeling like it's very hard to get back to it. Um, 
And one thing that it, I always think of and that I, I often mention in these conversations, people saying like, I'm trying to get back to my writing is, um, so, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a writer and a publisher. My husband's an architect. And um, one thing that we say all the time to each other is, you know, we have friends who are like dancers and actors and athletes, and there's such a expiration date for most people, for people in those careers, you know, when, when you have a physical body that is so reliant on, you know, being at your peak or, or, you know, just looking a certain way. And we feel so grateful that we found these paths that we can do as long as our brains keep up. Um, you know, there are writers who are still working in their nineties. There are architects who are still working in their nineties and they're vibrant and they're exciting and they're doing things everybody wants to know about. Um, and, and you just don't see that in other careers. And so, um, when I, I, when I'm having these conversations with people about coming back, I say, there's so much time, you know, you're not done. You, you could have your next book out in 20 years and, and, and you'll still be as, as the bards go pretty young, <laughs> you know? So um, that's one thing that I always try and say is you don't, don't push it and don't, don't feel too bad about yourself. And I reflect this back to myself because so often writing takes the back burner to the press and to publishing, um, which is not a complaint because I really love my job, but I don't write nearly as much as I sort of imagined that I would have earlier on in my career. Is it okay if I add to that? Yeah, of course. So sometimes we may feel as if um, having all this space to create, um, we, are we are, because we have that space, we are generating our best work. And that's not often the case, right? Just because we have the space doesn't necessarily mean that what we are doing is necessarily worthwhile. There's a place, there, I mean, there are times when writers should go through fallow periods where they're not producing, when they're not writing, it's okay, I think, for people to experience life, make mistakes, and have children if that's what they want to do, may, and go through all kinds of things because it's called living. I don't think poetry, or even fiction, nonfiction, all these things, any genre of writing is removed from living. Um, and that's what I used to think. And this is what my children have taught me. You know, they couldn't care less about oh, poetry. What, what is this thing? But, you know, let's play games. Let's, you know, run around. Let's play in the yard and all these things. Maybe then they'll come around and say, oh, daddy, you do poetry? What's that all about anyway? And it reminds me that the world is bigger than the little four square room where I create stuff. I, I think that's something to be said for that. You're not betraying anything if you're going through life, if there's things happening in your life at the moment that you can't control. I don't think you're betraying anything. And you know, it's okay for you to go through a week, a month without putting pen to paper. Um, it's not a race. Just thought I'd put that out there too. I have a friend in Nebraska who's a couple years older than me, who's a cattle rancher. And a few years back, he said, he looked at me and he said, Duane, my body is done. I cannot do anymore. I have, I have destroyed my body just in trying to stay alive and run this ranch. You, on the other hand, you've got a lot of time ahead of you and you can still do it. And I hadn't thought of it that way, but last year I had four books published. One of them I did myself. The other three, I did the proofing and all these things and putting them together. And I, I kept wondering, is this my life? I mean, I, I, I was amazed. Not, not that I didn't want to, but I'd never had bang, 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 book after book that somebody else was actually printing. And I was just doing all the support stuff. I mean, you know, and it was very amazing. And so it has given me a lot of hope that even though I couldn't write before in my life, that maybe I will have time now going forward. And, and I have two of my grandparents were in their late 90s when they died. And so, okay, I may have 20, 30 more years. That's a whole lifetime. I mean, that's a whole long time that I can do. I don't want to waste it, but 
I don't, I, I need not to panic, which I have in the past because panic is one of the things I'm good at. One of the things, anxiety or disorder, it just, it just goes. So I'm trying to say, okay, pace myself. It's okay. I've got time. I've done some stuff already and that's good. So it's, it's a very interesting try, shift trying to say, okay, I do have time, but I, but I don't need to waste the time. And it, it's, it's, it's very interesting right now, this transition sort of. Thank you. Thank you, Duane. And, and thank you so much to everybody um, on our panel tonight. I just dropped a few uh, things in the chat box here, as you'll see. Um, we, uh, if, if you are still looking for uh, your very own copy of Far Villages, I dropped the link in the text box there, uh, along with a coupon code to get 25% off. And actually, um, we have a bunch of book best coupon codes we're using right now. So um, that one's for the Brooklyn Book Fair for the rest of the month. You can get 25% off um, for our villages and any other, uh, any other book in our list. Um, and also uh, next week, and I might have a bio talk about this a little bit because he's going to be our uh, MC next week. We are going to have uh, an event same time next Tuesday with Stephen Page, uh, Jose Ang uh, uh, Angel Aragus, Ben White, uh, Gillian Parrish, and Kari Treese and Catherine Hummel discussing um, poetry as seeing a way of the world. And in, also in the chat box, I dropped in uh, the link if you would like to register. Abayo, do you want to say a little bit about next week's event? It's going to be amazing. <laughs> oh, you say that all the time. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Well, I think that we're just about coming to the end of our time. Um, and I know we've had a little bit of, uh, of problems with the sound. I'm sorry about that. You know, Zoom is what it is. Um, but I'm just so grateful to everybody who's been joining us for these events and also to uh, our contributors. I'm so, so very proud of this anthology. And one thing that um, many people have said, a bio included is, um, you know, if only you'd had this wisdom when you first started. Um, and, and that's one of our goals is to get this book into the hands of poets on the cusp, um, poets, you know, in the bud. And, uh, and, and we hope that we can accomplish that. And thank you for being part of, of the many offerings that we have in between these covers. Thank you so it's much. It's a wonderful everybody. conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll continue it next week, same time. We hope to see you there. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.